Introducing the amazing Flab Master. When seagulls mate, they mate. You're watching Dirt TV. All dirt, all the time. Hi. And thanks for joining us. Okay, what comes in many different colors, feels either grainy, smooth, or sticky, and is where we get our food, clothes, medicines, and our homes, just to name a few. I'd rather talk about my trip to the mall yesterday. <sighs> you don't know, do you? Well, let me think. Well, that's easy. We get all our stuff from malls. No, think. Well, come to think of it, some of the stuff I saw at the mall was grown or raised on a farm. So, it all comes from dirt, right? Sort of, but dirt is the stuff you sweep up on your kitchen floor, or you get on your clothes when you play soccer, and can always be found under your fingernails. <laughs> but when dirt is in the right spot, we call this dirt soil. Yeah, soil. That's what I meant to say. Come to think of it, everything at the mall comes from soil. The burger and ice cream I ate, the jeans, shoes, and sweater I bought. Unlike you, soil is very big. I'm not short. I'm just close to the soil, if you don't mind. And if you're thinking that learning about soil is not a big deal, and just about as interesting as dirt, then just imagine what life would be like without dirt. I mean soil. Yeah, soil is one of Earth's most important natural resources. From farms and gardens, we get vegetables. From planted fields, we get wheat, corn, and other grains to make breads and cereals. Fruit comes from trees that grow in soil. So does wood that's used to make lumber, paper, paints, and numerous other products. Nuts and berries come from farms and forests. Our food that comes from animals comes from the soil. Cows eat grass, hay, and grains to make milk, meat, and leather. All animals eat plants, plants that grow in soil. Fish live on plants, and these plants live on dissolved minerals that wash into our seas and our rivers and lakes from the soil. Let's face it, life without dirt wouldn't be any life at all. Dirt's your food, dude. And a whole lot more. For instance, minerals and gems are found in soil. The fuel that warms our houses comes from coal, and oil is goo that used to be plants and animals that grew millions of years ago because of soil. Even our roads are built using soil as a base. We depend on soils. And the people who work with them. Together they keep us alive and are a part of our food web. There is a lot we can learn about dirt, I mean soil. And making sure we don't run short. Watch it! I mean, run low. That better? Yes. So stick with us as we investigate dirt. Secrets in the soil. Soil can be found on most land surfaces and can be a mixture of many things. Maybe you've noticed soil looks and feels different in different places. Here's why. Below the surface of the earth lies solid rock. You can see this rock in many places in Utah. And can it ever be beautiful? Whew. Geologists and soil scientists, people who study rock and the forces that shaped our land, call this solid rock parent material. Speaking of soil, this is Bob Raisley. He's a geologist. Tell us, Bob, how do we get soil from parent material? Over billions of years, the rock of the planet breaks down into smaller and smaller rock fragments forming the soils we have today. The soil layers form from the different kinds of rocks, ocean bottom, land rocks, uh, and create many, many different kinds of soil profiles. This is a general soil profile. Why isn't it all just dirt? It's not all dirt because it actually has structure. We've got three different layers here inside the soil profile. The lower air, uh, part of the profile is called the parent material. It's where the rock actually breaks down into smaller fragments uh, and then broke, breaks down into even smaller fragments to form the middle layer, which is the subsoil. That's the zone that the animals burrow into. They can get in there and cre uh, create their burrows. That's where foxes, uh, rabbits, and uh, even some owls live. Inside this layer, 
plants put their roots to hold themselves up and steady. Big trees grow down into this. And on the top layer, that's a combination of this layer, the subsoil and the rotted plants. It's the living zone where plants grow and it's the area that we live off of, all the animals live off of. Without that, life on Earth wouldn't be particularly possible. Well, how long does it take to make an inch of topsoil? Inch of topsoil takes roughly about a thousand years. Wow. It actually is even longer for the entire foot of topsoil you see represented here. That would be 10,000 years. The rock that makes up the base of the topsoil takes around a few million to hundreds of millions of years to create. The rocks in Utah predate or are older than the dinosaurs. Utah geologic history is a history of planetary climate and rock building processes. Utah has been in and out of water many times over its geologic history and has been host to almost all forms of life known on Earth. The evidence of this rich history is in Utah's rocks and soil. There are sandy, rocky soils in the Uinta Mountains composed of nearly one billion year old floodplain sediments. The top of Mount Timpanogos is composed of 500 million year old ocean coral reefs at 11,000 feet in the air. Caves have since formed in that mountain. Bryce Canyon's red and white beauty is the result of ancient lake deposits. Zion's and Arches National Parks are composed of hundreds of feet of fossil sand dunes of a large ancient desert. The Colorado Plateau and Canyonlands hold some of the world's most interesting fossils, the dinosaurs. Mixed in with the dinosaurs are rocks of periods of time when the area was under seawater. These rocks weather to salty soils in the book cliffs of Price and Green River area and into the red soils of the southern tier of the state near St. George and Kanab. The climate of the last 10,000 years has been most important in forming the soils of Utah's modern surface. Ancient Lake Bonneville covered the western half of Utah and left its clay, silty soils in the valley bottoms, including the Wasatch Front. Glaciers covered most of Utah above eight to 9,000 feet and left sand and boulder deposits on the mountains and in the canyons. The soils we have are the product of billions of years of geologic process and the most recent climate in Utah. And yet they are an extremely fragile resource. We're losing our topsoil at 15 times the rate that it's being made. Well, thanks for coming by, Bob. Yeah, we'll see you in a little bit. Yep, we'll see you, you're welcome. In Utah and most Western states, our topsoil is only one to 12 inches deep, and that's not much. Our topsoil layer is shallow. Farmers, ranchers, and others who use the land must be careful to help hold topsoil in its place, keep it healthy, and even build up topsoil for future generations. But because it can take hundreds of years to build a small layer of soil, it's classified as a non-renewable resource. Once our good topsoil's gone, it's gone. Now for the nitty gritty. Topsoil is composed of three basic kinds of matter, solid stuff, liquid stuff, and gases. The solid stuff accounts for about half of the volume of soil. The solid particles in soil are mostly minerals. Minerals come from the rocks that have broken apart because of water that flows into the cracks of the rock and then freezes. When water freezes, it expands, so tiny little bits of rock are broken off. When the water flows again, it carries these tiny bits away into the soil. Also, plant roots can grow into soft rock and break it apart. Chemicals can break rocks apart too. Many rocks are broken apart by lichens, tiny crusty plants that live on rocks. Lichens come in many colors and give off an acid that breaks down the minerals in the rock. Mineral matter takes up about 45% of the total volume of soils. About 5% of soil is organic matter. Organic matter is dead, decaying plants, insects, and other stuff that used to be alive. This is composted cow manure and straw. Organic matter is usually located at the top of soil. As this organic layer decays, it supplies nutrients to help the plants that live in the soil. This organic stuff is what makes soil fertile. These particles of solid minerals and organic stuff fit loosely together, leaving room in between. 
The space between solid particles is filled with gas in the form of air and liquid in the form of water. If there is little water in soil, then the space in between will be filled with air. But when rainwater soaks the soil, the air is replaced until the soil dries out again. Because the weather is always changing, the amounts of air and water are always changing too. But an average soil contains about 25% water and 25% air. Water and air in the soil are very important to the plants and animals that live in the soil. When plants suck up water, they also take in nutrients like iron and nitrogen. These nutrients come from organic matter. Plus, lots of organic matter helps make sure that the soil stays moist. Let's compare soils that are high and low in organic matter. Organic matter holds moisture by absorbing it. This sand in this container has very little organic matter, so it holds very little water. It drains and dries up quickly. But when soil has lots of organic matter, it holds more moisture. Plus, these kinds of soils don't pack down as much. Now, even though all soils share common ingredients, the actual combination of particles in soils can vary a lot. Most soils are a mixture of large particles commonly known as sand, medium-sized particles called silt, and smaller particles called clay. Ooh, that looks like a dirt milkshake. And holding it is Deborah Spillmaker. She teaches kids about agriculture, and that's pretty darn close to the dirt. You're right, it does look like a dirt shake. But if you let it settle out, the biggest particle, which is? Sand. Will settle out first. And within the first 60 seconds, you'll see that layer of sand. The next one is the next sized particle, which is? Silt. And finally? The clay. The clay will settle out. If you look here, you can see the organic matter floating on top. When you first add the water, the organic matter always floats. But after a couple of days, it'll settle to the bottom. And here you can see the layers. Each soil is a different color, and so you'll see different colors of layers. But if the parent material is very close, then you may not see those layers very carefully. That's why you have to time it when it settles down. But if you really want to test soil textures, you've got to feel them. And here we have three different samples. Remember there was sand, silt, and clay. Not only are the particles different sizes, but the particles feel different. And so we'll take, first of all, our soil samples, and let's see if you can figure out which one is which. You gotta have, you gotta do it with water. Because if you don't do it with water and just feel it, you say, oh, that's kind of bumpy, yeah, that one's kind of bumpy, and they all feel the same. But when you add water, it'll make a big difference. Let's start with this one right here in the middle. Just gonna wet it down. Wow, look at the water move through that. Now let's put some in your hand. And some in yours. Now rub it between your fingers like this. What do you feel? Uh, sand. Is it gritty? Feel hard particles a little bit like sandpaper? Mm -hmm. We would say that this is a sandy sample then. This is fun. Yeah, it's really fun to play in the soil. But let's put this sample back into the bowl and rinse off our hands. I brought a bucket. And all we have to do is dip our hands in here real quick so we don't contaminate the rest of our samples to test the next one. Okay, no flicking though. Oh, sorry. <laughs> all right, let's try this one. Let's have your hand. Put just your hand like this, other hand, because you're right-handed. There you go. What you're doing is you're just feeling it between your finger and your thumb to see if you can feel any grittiness or what silt feels like Ew. is smoothness. Ooh. What's it like? It's like mud. It's like mud. All soil is mud when it's wet. But this is special mud because it's a different feeling. Do you feel any grit in there like you did before? No. Uh -uh. There's no grit. Is it smooth? Is it a little bit like baby powder? Yeah. Kind of. Kind of like baby powder. It's what? It's, it's silt. silt. That's right. It's silt. And silt will feel smooth, and it's the sort of stuff that you feel on the bottoms of lakes sometimes when you're at reservoirs, and it squishes up between your toes. Well, it really sticks to your fingers, and it kind of stains them, too. And it won't be as easy to get off as the sand, so we'll have to rub our hands on the edge of the bowl. Now it'll be a little bit more difficult to get off, too, even when we stick our hands in this bucket of water. It's really important when you're testing soils to rinse your hands between because if you don't, you'll contaminate the next group. So get it all off, but no flicking. Okay. All right, is everybody clean? We don't have to dry them between each one because we're just going to get them wet and muddy again. We won't dry until the last sample. All right. 
We've already moistened up this little ball of mud, but let's find out what's so special about this ball of mud and what kind of particles it might have in it. Go ahead and put that between your fingers. See if you can feel any grit in there. You might feel a little bit at first. Work it between your fingers. Sometimes it takes a while with some particles. You have to really push it between your fingers and work it a little bit, especially if it's a clay sample, to get it to break apart. Now, do you feel any grit in there, Zach? Kind of, not, not like the first one. That's right. There's always going to be a little bit of grit and probably a little bit of smoothness because no soil is really totally pure. How does yours feel? Really sticky. That's right. Clay will feel sticky. And that's how you can tell if you've got a lot of clay by if it's the more stickier it is, the more clay it has. And so you work that between your fingers and it just sticks all over. You might say it's still a little bit smooth, but when that smoothness runs out, it really grabs. Again, this is a difficult one to get off your hands, so you've got to kind of get it into a ball and scrape it on the edge of the bowl. And then finally, rinse it all off. Most soils are not purely sand, silt, or clay. Most soils are a mixture of the three. We call this mixture a loam. But the soil ingredients do help to name the soil. For example, if you have a soil that has mostly sand, but you can still feel the smoothness of silt and the stickiness of clay, then you have a sandy loam. Or if the soil sample is very sticky, but you still feel some grittiness, you may have a clay loam. By feeling the soil and using the water or mud shake test, soil scientists determine the soil texture name. The texture names are on the soil textural triangle. If you mark your percent of sand, silt, and clay on the appropriate side of the triangle, then draw lines in the noted direction where the lines meet or intersect, you will find your soil texture name. Scientists have found over 7,000 different types of soil on Earth. And in fact, in Utah, we have over 3,000 types. It can be anything from the red soils of southern Utah to the very dark, rich soils of northern Utah. And in those soils, remember, the color is determined not so much about this, by the particle size, but by the parent material. The color of the minerals that was in the parent material determines the color. It doesn't have anything to do with the texture. And the best way to determine texture is the way that you folks just did, and that was by feeling it. Farmers need to be familiar with the texture of their soils because different crops do better in certain soils. It's all a matter of water. For proper irrigation, farmers need to know how much water their soil will hold and how their fields will drain. Soil textures determine how and where homes, buildings, roads, and bridges are built. So, are you wondering what type of soil you have in your yard? If you want to know, collect the sample in a Ziploc bag and send it to a soil lab. It may cost just a little, but you'll know a lot about what you need to do to help your plants grow best. We've learned a lot in the last several years about how to take care of our soils so that people, plants, and animals can continue to live there. But it wasn't so long ago that people didn't care much about our soil. And what happened affected the life of just about everyone living in this country in the 1930s. Well, it was in 1935. We'd be in school. All of a sudden, the wind had come up and it gets so dusty and dark, you couldn't see. You could see across the street. It was just like a big cloud settled down over Grantsville, only it was dust. We could see the dust clouds rolling towards Grantsville in just big, black, ugly clouds. Any time the south wind blew, you knew Grantsville was in for a, a good dusting down. And my <coughs> younger sister and we used to cross the street to go to school get a hold of hands and we'd stand there and wait and wait and wait and think, well now is there a car going to come? And we'd listen and listen. You couldn't see unless and unless the cars they had their headlights on, they could see a little glow or glimmer. So we'd listen and we'd run across, was scared, didn't know whether we was gonna be hit or not. I don't know about you, but it's hard to imagine not being able to see to cross the street to get to school because of huge clouds of blowing dust. 
but it did happen right here in Utah in the 1930s, just over the western mountains from Salt Lake City in a town called Grantsville. I've heard a lot of people say they used to hang wet sheets over their windows and things like that to try and keep the dust from coming in their houses. And so I don't know, it was just really bad, that's all it was. According to the people who lived in Grantsville, they, they were just uh, just being driven nuts by the dust, uh, dust everywhere. You couldn't, you can't protect any home, even the modern day home, from dust. I remember back in the, when I'd go to movies, once in a while you'd get to go to a movie, and they would always show a newsreel prior to the movie, and they would always show the, the dust bowl back in the Middle West. Well, we didn't need to look at that dust bowl back there in the Middle West. All we had to do was look out the windows many days or just step outside and you could see the, the movie was right there in your eyes. Here you actually see one of the dust clouds that are causing such havoc. Spreading over the countryside like a pall, it envelops everything. The black lizard that is turning our Great Plains region into a desert. News more important than anything else because it affects our food supply and the future of our farm country. From the panhandle of Texas to the prairies of the Dakotas, nature has cast this blight over much of America's greatest farming region. But the area is not yet lost to man. Even in the shaded sections, which are hardest hit, the situation is not hopeless. The danger of surrendering to nature's attack of drought and wind is obvious. The topsoil, the surface layer of earth in which crops grow, is being lost. First, drought dried up this soil, killing the crops. The land, left idle and bare, was baked by the sun and swept by the wind. As the moisture it drew from the subsoil was exhausted, the topsoil crumbled into fine particles of dust, lighter than sand. These the wind picked up, whirling the particles into the air, stripping the land of its productive topsoil. Today everyone asks, what can be done to save our soil? But the dust didn't blow only in Utah. Much of America's Great Plains region was devastated by the dust storms in the 1930s. Before this disaster, this area was known as America's breadbasket. Soon it was known as the Dust Bowl. April 14, 1935 is a day that will be remembered as Black Sunday. It was the day when strong prairie winds started blowing across the Great Plains, pelting small towns and big cities alike with tons and tons of the nation's richest topsoil. Car lights had to be turned on in the middle of the day, and for millions of Americans, daily life became miserable. Today we know what caused our soil to blow and turn a huge portion of our country into a dust bowl. Here's Michelle King from Two News to tell us more about it. The story actually begins in the 1920s, when farmers in the Midwest enjoyed steady, predictable rains when new modern methods brought faster and more powerful tractors and other machinery that made it easy to dig up America's grassy prairies and put down wheat and other crops. Millions of acres were plowed under, and year after year, farmers took bumper crops from the soil. But they didn't realize what the cost of those bountiful harvests would be. They grew the same crops in the same fields year after year. They did little to put natural organic matter back into the soil. By farming in this way, they were slowly using up the plant nutrients like nitrogen in the soil, and their soils were getting lighter and less likely to hold water. Then in the middle 1930s, a serious drought hit much of America. The rains came much less often. Most farmers had no other way to water their crops. They could only plant their crops and pray, and then watch them wither and die, then try again. The drought lasted for at least three years in a row, Without moisture, the already overworked and underloved soil turned closer to dust with each pass of the plow. With no strong plant roots from grasses or farmers' crops, the dry soil simply started to blow away with the wind. News more important than anything else because it affects our food supply and the future of our farm country. The movie newsreels of the day captured the devastation of the Dust Bowl and its effect on the lives of the farmers that depended on the land that was flying out from underneath their feet. They had to do something. They had nothing to eat. They were blown out and stormed out and dusted out, and they had to leave. Consequently, they loaded their wives and children and all of their belongings, including mattresses, on top of their jalopies and headed westward for California. 
more than a quarter million people packed their belongings. With cries of, California, here we come, they set out, hoping to find a better place. But what many of these immigrants found in California were fear, prejudice, and too few jobs for too many hopeful farmers. Many, no doubt, traveled west through Utah. And when they got to the Tooele Valley and near the small town of Grantsville, they found drought and dust much like they had left. And while Utah's Dust Bowl problem was every bit as bad as the one in the Midwest, its cause, at least at first, was different. People still remember what happened. You want me to tell you about the Dust Bowl? The Dust Bowl was caused by overgrazing in this valley due to the fact that we didn't have much moisture come after the sheep was all over here. Overgrazing did have something to do with it because just east of Grantsville, they used to have a big shearing place there and they used to run an awful lot of sheep out on the desert and in those days they all trailed right through Grantsville see they didn't have trucks or anything to haul them like they have nowadays. In order to protect the sheep they wouldn't be able to shear them sometimes for a week or so because of this wet stormy weather and of course the sheep would be out on grazing in this area. And a snowstorm come in and they had to keep the sheep here for maybe a week or two and they just took all the vegetation to walk. Uh, I understand that we're, uh, a lot of times we're six to 7,000 sheep in this small area of, uh, you know, 10, 12 miles square. And so it really denuded the, the uh, vegetation. Then we had a dry year, and then we had a fire come down from up to Hickman and come through and take whatever was left. And that, I depleted everything in the valley. What caused the, the Dust Bowl in the first place, to start with, it was overgrazed. But the main thing that caused it was the drought that we had back in those days and the wind. It, it seemed like it blew all the time. The farm and ranch families living in Grantsville in the 1930s suffered in the same way as those in Middle America. For many, the drought and the wind dried up any hope that they had of holding on to their land and their way of living. Well, the land was uh, lost by a lot of people due to the fact they couldn't pay their taxes. And so the county had the, uh, uh, took the land. And then when they formed the soil conservation in 1938, the county gave the land to the soil conservation to start uh, reseeding it to try and bring, uh, bring back the vegetation. Realizing something must be done to save what was left of America's farmlands, the United States Department of Agriculture formed the Soil Conservation Service in 1938. The purpose of the SCS, as it was known, was to assist farmers in learning new ways to use and improve their precious soil. Government experts taught the farmer how to revive and protect the soil. In a long-range conservation program, he was taught new ways of planting and plowing, that would hold the moisture in the land when the rain stopped, that would keep it from blowing when the winds came. Today, the seeds of hope planted in the Tooele Valley by the SCS more than 60 years ago continue to grow. Uh, this is crested wheatgrass was br uh, brought in here in, the, in about 38 uh, uh, planted due to the fact they said it would grow in an arid country. Utah's Dust Bowl area was reseeded. Irrigation systems were built. Local soil conservation districts were established all across the state. And after a lot of work and years of patience, the land began to be useful again. Today, the people who manage the Grantsville Soil Conservation District are still the primary protectors of the agricultural land in the Tooele Valley. It's their job to make sure that the practice of grazing livestock doesn't blow up in everybody's face. Uh, the decisions are made as to number of cattle, the type of planting, what pastures. These pastures are all rotated so that they're not overgrazed. Uh, sometimes uh, we've experimented with various grasses to find out which will produce the most forage and which will keep the soil stable and, and in a good thrifty condition. We lease the feed, not the land, we lease the feed out to the uh, Grantsville Grazing Association 
and then they tell us where they're going to put the cows and if we approve that then uh, then that's the way they go and that's the purpose of the soil conservation districts not only this one here but the ones throughout the nation is to preserve this so that these people can uh, still provide food and fiber for the American population and actually for the world. If you were to visit the area around Grantsville today, you wouldn't have to look very hard to uncover evidence of those Dust Bowl days. In many places, blown soil still buries fence lines, and the white subsoil shows through the sparse growth of grass. Yet the Grantsville Dust Bowl days are fading from memory, but the lessons learned from those dark days will hopefully always stay with us. Well, the lesson we learned is, is conservation. Take care of what you have and improve it all the time. The farmers of America have fed this country and the better part of the world for a number of years, but it won't happen if we deplete our soils. Your food doesn't come from the grocery store. It comes from fields like this and from fields like this, even though they don't look like there's much there. There's a lot of meat that comes off of those fields. Crops behind me are are lush and beautiful because the ground has been cared for properly, the irrigation and water has been used wisely, this ground in front of me has been managed properly so as to harvest the grasses that are there in the form of meat and uh, we just need to keep doing that. It has to happen. If it doesn't happen uh, we're all going to pay for it in the, in the form of hungry people. Hey, what you doing? Making my own dust bowl. Hey, what are you doing? Creating a windbreak. A windbreak? Yeah, it's one good way for keeping the soil from blowing away. To make a windbreak, all you need to do is plant a row of tall trees on the side of the field that the wind usually blows from. The wind hits the trees and has to go up and over. There's less wind near the ground, so dry soil doesn't blow away. But dryness isn't the only thing that can cause valuable soil to disappear. Wetness can be just as destructive when there is too little plant cover or organic matter to help hold the soil in place. True. Even normal amounts of rainfall can cause big problems if the soil is left uncovered with no plant roots to help hold the soil. The problem can be explosive. Check this out. This is video in slow motion of your average raindrop hitting the earth at a speed of 15 miles an hour. That doesn't sound so fast. Well. You're just looking at one raindrop. Now consider that the impact or force of lots of raindrops hitting soil particles over one square mile. That equals 10,000 tons of TNT. Now that's powerful. It seems like we'd all notice something like that. Well, fortunately most of the ground around us has plants like grass or trees to cover it or is paved so that rain falls on the cement, not bare dirt. But when rain does fall on exposed soil, the result can be pretty amazing. Remember that each and every raindrop can splash soil as far as five feet away. That adds up to a lot of dirt being moved around. A two inch rain may remove one inch of unprotected soil per acre. That's 150 tons of soil washing somewhere else. Where does it all go? Look closely next time it rains and you'll see. What you'll be witnessing is the process of erosion. Raindrops splash onto the soil and move it around. Rainwater collects on land and runs off in small streams that carry away lots of tiny bits of soil. These streams gather together to form larger streams, then rivers and lakes, and so on. Streams or rivers can be loaded with eroded soil, especially in areas where there's lots of exposed soil. The process of erosion is a natural one. It goes on all the time and has forever. It's the process that has formed some of Utah's and the world's most spectacular scenery. For millions and millions of years, water and wind have carved out the Grand Canyon, Bryce Canyon, and other beautiful areas like Zion National Park. But erosion doesn't just happen in the wilderness, it happens everywhere, and its effects, while natural, are not always positive especially when you're talking about taking away the small amount of productive topsoil the world has. There are different kinds of erosion. Landslides are serious erosion on steep hillsides. 
Landslides have buried whole towns throughout history and continue to be a problem. After all, what's up usually comes down. On flatter ground, sheet erosion removes thin layers of soil over a long period of time. It can go unnoticed until much of the topsoil is gone. You can see real erosion along new roadways or any other bare sloping ground. Water forms small, well-defined channels that carry soil away. When rills become large, the process is called gully erosion. In many places, gully erosion has created spectacular natural disasters by carrying away tons and tons of soil. So does that mean the Grand Canyon's just a big example of gully erosion? That's one way to look at it. But the Earth can't just be one big national park. We have to preserve our farmlands so we can eat and have clothes and... And live! One thing is to remember that plants keep soil from blowing and washing away. If we plant and take care of our grass and stuff, our soil won't wash away. I've also seen gardeners spreading bark chips on top of the dirt around their plants. That's right. Those bark chips are a form of mulch. Mulch can be wood chips, grass clippings, any big piece of natural material that will cover soil for a while, but decays naturally. That's great if you're planting a permanent lawn or garden at your house. Don't farmers need to expose the soil to plant crops every year? It's true that many farmers' fields are bare, at least a small part of the time, and it's true that some erosion takes place. But it's truly amazing what can be done to control erosion by using just a few common sense ideas, like planting cover crops. Cover crops? Yeah. In the fall, some farmers will harvest the crops they've been growing all summer and then plant certain plants that will grow quickly, putting down roots and covering the ground to protect the soil until the farmer tills his fields the following spring. Then, the farmer just tills in the cover crop, which by itself is one good way to return some natural organic matter back to the soil. It's like living mulch. Exactly. Farmers also rotate their crops. They'll grow one crop on their land one year and another the next. Planting different crops every year will help keep the soil nutrients from becoming used up. Sometimes farmers will even give a part of their land a rest for a year or two. You know, I've seen where farmers will grow corn but leave the corn stalks in the ground all winter. Exactly. Even though the corn has been harvested, the stalks still help protect the soil from rain and the roots still hold the soil in place. I know what else. I've seen farms on hillsides and the farmers have terraced the land. They've plowed level places that look like steps a giant might use. I'm sure that helps keep erosion from taking place because the landscape isn't as steep anymore. Good examples of terracing can be found all over Utah. You can also see in some terraced areas that farmers have left some trees or grasses. This helps preserve the landscape. Unfortunately, you can see examples of what can happen when you don't terrace. In this video, you can pick out how the subsoil has been exposed by years of topsoil erosion. The topsoil was gradually washed off the steep hillside. That's it, all collected down at the bottom of the hill. Terracing could have helped prevent that. The rows in that field run right down the hill, too. By running the rows in the same direction as the slope of the hill, the farmer is creating hundreds of little stream beds that run right downhill. It would have been better to practice what's called contour plowing and planting. Remember Deborah Spielmaker? She teaches kids about agriculture, and she's going to show us how contour plowing works. That's right, Zach. It's pretty easy to control erosion when you're plowing on flat ground. But when a farmer comes to a hill, he needs to do something else. And rather than going up and over the hill, even though that's fun in a tractor, what it does is it causes little rills or gullies to form, and as it rains, the, the topsoil runs downhill and ends up at the bottom. What's easier or better to do is if you go around the hill, and that's called farming on the contour. And what that does is it leaves deep furrows or plow marks on the side of the hill, and that way the water will be caught in the little furrows. Let's visit some kids from Wellsville Elementary School who, with the help of Dr. Rich Koenig, are going to learn a lot more about how to control soil erosion. Okay, what are some of the things we do to control soil erosion? We've got several demonstrations here. This is what's called leaving residue, crop residue, on the soil surface. This is just straw, straw from a wheat field. If we leave that on the surface, it'll help to anchor the soil in place. 
This is another technique called strip cropping. Here we've got strips of a crop, in this case grass, alternated with strips of bare soil. So we might be growing something like corn or grain here in these areas, but we're leaving these strips in grass. So we've got something here that'll help hold the soil in place. This would be like the lawn on your front yard, for example, or maybe a pasture where you've got cows grazing. This is continuous cover. This is a crop that we always have in place, um, something there to anchor the soil. This is an example of something that we call contour farming. If the slope is running this direction and water is moving this direction off of a slope or off of a field, and we plow, we make furrows in the opposite direction of the movement of water, we'll actually trap some water in each of these furrows and trap some of the soil. So this should also reduce soil erosion. And then the final demonstration we have here is just a cropped field, a field where we have a plant growing. This um, is wheat, young wheat plants growing. Um, this is also going to trap the soil. It's going to hold the soil in place um, as rain or, or other water moves across the field. Next, some girls will cause a rain event on these small fields, and some boys will help catch the rain and clear beakers as it runs off. By comparing the amount of eroded soil in each beaker, we can see which erosion control method works best. Which of the plantings do you think will keep the most soil in the pan, and which will keep the least? I would guess that the pans with the most plants covering the soil and holding it in place would lose the least amount of soil. Yeah, and the trees with the least plants and the most bare dirt would lose the most soil. Are we right? You sure are. But if you really want to know about farming, you should visit with my friend Bill Rigby. He lives in Centerville, and he's been farming there with his family, well, since before Bill was Bill. I started farming here with my father many years ago. He started in the 1800s, and we had quite a slope here. We used to just raise hay and grain and orchard because it was so steep. Put the water now out of open ditches into closed pipes. We've pressurized the water so we can put the water where we need it, and. Uh, we can bring it out in the amounts that we need to water either 10 rows or 50 rows, whichever we wish. We've also controlled the erosion by putting it in gated pipe. When we bring it out of the uh, pressure pipe, we put it in gated pipe and we can measure that gate just to where it'll just come to the end of a 400 foot row and just barely seep out of the row. Thereby we do two things, we stop the erosion and we get the most out, about 80% efficiency out of our water system. Okay, this is what we call this green patch of grass here and where the tree is, our settling pond, because we bring the water from that side of the field and this side of the field, and it all congregates right here, and any amount of silt or sand has to run through this grass and we stop it. And we bring it over here to a ditch. This is the sand right here that we pull out of this ditch. We'll shovel it out just, oh, maybe every four or five days, we'll shovel a little sand out here. You can see the silt. This is this heavier black, silt that comes out out of the sand and this is the sand and that's not much for a full summer's work maybe a yard or two of sand out of that whole field maybe what seven or eight acres of farm ground there and we feel that we've got a real good program going because we don't get much erosion and what erosion we do every four or five years we can pack it back up the hill and respread it on the ground thus we don't wear out our resource we keep that resource in place as you can see Farmers and their families have spent years trying to improve their land. They've put ditches in, trying to control the water, and also other measures to control runoff or soil erosion from occurring. Erosion, though, doesn't just start on the farm. Erosions can be found in other places, too. Any time people disturb or uncover the soil is a time to keep erosion in mind. Construction of buildings and roads disturbs large areas, altering the natural water flow in the area. Builders can be careful to leave existing plants undisturbed or introduce plant cover to the area or spread mulch to keep the soil in place. They can build ponds that will catch the water and give runoff a place to go. They can build fences called silt fences or other barriers to catch the soil that would otherwise be carried away down the steep slopes. Erosion control is a real challenge, even if it's not on farms or around construction. Another friend of mine, Brent Bunderson, works for Utah State University Extension Service in Tooele County. One of the things that he looks at is controlling erosion and improving the soil in areas most of us would consider wild and natural. He's at an area where there's really no topsoil at all, just subsoil rock and sand, a surface condition that's sometimes called pebble pavement. Topsoil plays a very important role in the proper functioning of a watershed. 
we're standing on a site uh, where most of the topsoil has been eroded away. Uh, all that is left here at the surface is the, the pebbles or rocks that was part of that soil. We call this a, a pebble pavement. Um, if we take a closer look at this pebble pavement, we'll see that it would be rather difficult, if not impossible, for the seeds of uh, grass and flowers to become established here. There just isn't any fine soil. However, if we uh, dig down just a little bit, we can see that there is pretty good soil underneath there. Um, the events that created this situation here were uh, several things. One of them was that uh, when the settlers came here, whenever there was a fire uh, started by lightning, they would run out and put the fire out. Uh, that allowed trees to uh, spread. The other thing that uh, was involved in this was uh, grazing of livestock. Um, the combination of the two left the, the area without any grass. Uh, and it also created a condition that uh, led to some pretty serious erosion. Here we have another example of the pebble pavement created by the conditions that we talked about earlier, the presence of the junipers and, and grazing. Simply removing the junipers is not going to correct the situation. We have to have some kind of major disturbance to bring soil to the surface. One of the best tools that we have to cause this disturbance, to bring soil to the surface again and to remove the junipers is a treatment called chaining. This area here was chained, burned, and reseeded just a year ago. This provides excellent habitat for wildlife and feed for livestock and for the, the wildlife. To establish grasses and flowers and other shrubs once again in an area that has been overtaken by juniper forests, some land managers resort to a practice called chaining. These trees are removed all at once and native grasses and other plants are planted. In a short time, the area is transformed. The fine root systems developed by grasses act as water channels that carry rainwater deep into the earth that will fill our underground water supplies. People rely on underground water for drinking. But all water doesn't immediately soak into the soil. When it rains, the water has to go somewhere. That's right. Water runs downhill, and that's why farmers, ranchers, and other landowners don't farm the lowland area. Instead, they keep these areas as waterways, lined with grass. They work with nature by letting the water go its natural way, without causing erosion. Not too long ago, many people looked at low-lying areas where water collects as a nuisance, places to be filled in or drained and made into farmland or neighborhoods. But more and more, we're learning about how these areas, called wetlands, fit in our environment. They're very important. Wetlands provide a natural filter for our Earth's water supply. Someone told me that three quarters of the Earth is covered with water. That means 25% is land. If you'll imagine that this apple is the Earth, if you cut the apple into four equal parts, three parts represent the oceans of the world. This fourth part would be the land. Now if we cut the land into two equal parts, this section would represent the deserts, swamps, mountains, and arctic regions of the world. This other section, one-eighth of the world's land, represents the area where people can live and may be able to grow food. Now we'll slice this already small section into four equal parts. These three sections represent the areas of the world that are too rocky, wet, hot, or have soil too poor to grow crops, as well as areas such as cities and suburbs where people live and work. If we peel the skin from this last section, the peeling would represent one thirty-second of the earth. That's the amount of soil we have to depend on to grow crops to feed the entire world. Remember what happened in the 1930s, the Dust Bowl days? Over 300,000 families lost their homes, their land, and their livelihoods because their soil could no longer grow crops. Food shortages and higher food prices affected millions of Americans, and even people from other countries who depended on American farmers. Today, agriculture gives more Americans jobs than any other industry. Out of every 100 people, 20 have jobs that rely on agriculture. The United States exports more farm products than any other country in the world, bringing in billions and billions of dollars. But the truth is, even billions of dollars wouldn't mean a thing if we didn't have food. 
it's very hard to put a price on the world's farmlands. Without good soils, farmers would find it harder and more expensive to grow food crops, and we'd all pay the price at the grocery store, if there was any food to be had at all. Since it takes 100 to 1,000 years to make one inch of topsoil, we can't plan on having any new topsoil around. So everyone must take care of the topsoil we already have. What's up, Bob? Looks like a math problem. Well, it is a math problem. We're trying to put a value on topsoil. Let's assume we got one acre of ground. Now, an acre is the size of a football field with the extra space to the bleachers, or it's the size of about five houses in their yards. Over that acre, we have seven inches of soil before we get into the subsurface. And each inch, just for our math purposes, is $10. So that means that our seven inches of soil is worth $70. Now, that surface of the uh, acre is being acted on by soil loss, which is erosion at the rate of one half inch per year. Now, that half inch of soil loss is one half of this value, which is $5. $5. So we lose $5 every year, and this means we lose $65, or we have a value of $65 at the end of that year. This goes on every year till we run out of topsoil and we just keep losing our little half inches. If a half inch of soil loss occurs per year, we lose one inch every two years. And if we have seven full inches and we lose one inch per year, seven times two is 14 years and our topsoil's gone. 14 years, losing half an inch per year is a lot of topsoil. If that really happened, farmers wouldn't be in business very long, and we'd all be starving. What can we do to save soil? Well, you've already learned many of the simple things we can do to save soil. Prevent erosion by planting windbreaks, by keeping soils covered up with plants, cover crops, and mulches. We can be careful to use contour planting, terraces, and other ways to prevent water erosion. We can use conservation measures such as strip cropping and crop rotation to keep our soils from getting all the life taken out of them. So don't all farmers do all that? Many do, and over the last 30 years, we've slowed the rate at which our soil is eroding by quite a bit. However, Utah is losing five tons per acre per year. Five tons? At this rate, it will take, let's see, five tons times, well, well, I don't know how to figure it out, but we've got to do something. I mean, what will we do when the topsoil's all gone? Truth is, there isn't much we could do without good earth in which to grow crops. The survival of the human race depends on our saving our soils. So scientists are looking for ways to produce food while saving the topsoil. It's an area of research called sustainable agriculture. The goal is to lose no more topsoil than is created naturally every year. And the good news is that half a ton of topsoil is being made in Utah every year. Made? Yep, and every little bit helps. One way we're helping nature make topsoil is by plowing cover crops back into the earth. A new method that's being studied and used is called no-till farming. No-till farmers use the latest equipment to plant food crops with very little disturbance to the cover crop that already grows in the field. Can't anything else be done? The best chance we have is if we all take care of our own land, whether it's a backyard, a family farm, or a roadway. Thanks, Bob. Yeah, thanks. Well, you're very welcome. There is a lot we can do in our own yards to keep our soils healthy. Maybe you've heard the saying, what goes around comes around. That saying could have been invented when talking about composting. is where you take plant materials that used to be grown in the soil and let them rot or decompose and then add them back into the soil to make it healthier and help plants grow. Rotting plants? That must stink! Not at all if you do it right and composting is pretty easy and is very good for the soil. Last fall we visited Shauna Owens, a gardener who practices composting to show us how. What's one thing that we can do to improve our soil? Well, we can add compost. Well, what's compost? Compost is decomposed organic matter. The pile I have down here at my feet, this resembles soil, and, and that's what compost is. It's, it 
physically resemble soil. This pile right here is about 80% decomposed organic matter. Um, soil has been added to it and other things have been added to it, but it's mostly decomposed organic matter. Originally, what this was, was piles, was organic matter such as leaves and grass and shredded things from my garden. That's originally what it was. And then, after a certain amount of time, we'll talk about that in just a moment, I end up with a product that physically resembles soil. What does compost do for the soil? Well, it helps reduce soil crusting. Here in Utah, we have generally really clay soil or we have sand soil. And it helps reduce soil crusting on the surface. It helps water to retain into the uh, soil. And it also helps with porosity. Well, what's porosity? Here's some more science words. Porosity is talking about the spaces between the pores of the soil. And when you add organic matter, it fills in those spaces with we call it organic glue, and it helps the, the soil to retain moisture, and it also helps to uh, feed your plants. This bin is a pile of organic matter that I've just barely put together. When you first build your compost pile, the ingredients are rather simple, and you can even think in color, okay? Think brown and think green. Brown are like dead, brown materials such as leaves and twigs and you can even try to identify what you've put in your bin. These are I think sunflower husks and green are like fresh clippings from your garden or kitchen scraps, grass clippings and actually grass clippings and leaves are two of the number one waste products that we send to our landfill so what a better way to reduce the amount of materials to our landfills but to compost them. When you're talking about the materials that you put in your bin, it's really important to remember the proportions. So when you think brown to green, generally the, the best combination is two parts brown or two parts carbohydrates to one part green. And green represents the nitrogen. And these are the building blocks for the microorganisms and fungi that are in your pile. The fungi are like, not like fleshy fungi that you, maybe like mushrooms that you buy at the grocery store, but filamentous fungi. If you look at this grass, it's covered with a white powder, and this is the one of the decomposers in your compost bin, the filamentous fungi. And it, uh, think of it like spaghetti. That's what it looks like underneath the microscope. And it's really important that if you get clumps of grass, that you break the, the fungal clumps up and mix them back into your pile. The other important decomposer in your compost is bacteria. And bacteria, big science word, they're ubiquitous, and that means we're surrounded in the air, in the water, in the soil. And the greatest concentration of bacteria are in the soil. So basically what you're doing in your compost bin is you're feeding the bacteria and the fungi, and you feed them with your yard wastes and kitchen wastes. This is finished compost right here. And finished compost, the original materials I put into the compost are unrecognizable. I can't tell that this used to be leaves and grass and clippings from my garden and yard. Um, there's many ways that you can use to finish compost. You don't just like let it sit in the bin and, and look at it, you use it in your yard and your garden. Remember, the most important thing, there is no wrong way to compost. If you turn your pile frequently, you're going to have decomposition occur quicker. If you just let your pile sit there for a year, it's still going to decompose. Time is just the issue. Slow or fast, it doesn't matter, just compost. There is another way that you can compost over the winter months and that is by using red wigglers. Red wigglers are a type of an earthworm that you can add your kitchen scraps to. They're much smaller than a regular earthworm and they are fantastic eaters. It's about 250 earthworms will go through six pounds of your kitchen scraps in one week. The nice thing about the worm castings, that's what um, the worms leave behind after they eat your kitchen scraps is that they're even more rich than regular compost. Your plants would love a little side dressing of the worm castings. I generally will chop up my, um, and doesn't this look tasty, chop up my kitchen scraps, whether peels or leftover salad and eggshells, coffee grinds, things like that. 
It's really important though, please do not put meat or dairy products in your earthworm composter or your other compost bins. They do not decompose rapidly um, and they can attract uh, rodents and raccoons to your compost bin. So I grind it up because, well, earthworms are small. You grind it up small so that they can eat it quicker and faster. Maybe that could be somebody's job in the house is to grind up the salad, leftover salad and kitchen peelings. And I mix it in with the soil and the earthworms. Another nice thing about earthworm composting is that you can also recycle your newspapers because you use newspapers to make the bedding for the earthworms, about 12 to 18 inches. You take your newspaper and you tear it in strips. The thing to remember though, don't use the glossy part of the newspaper. Tear it in, just tear it in strips and place it on the bottom of your bin. You can call your agricultural extension service and they can give you the designs of how to build a simple earthworm composting bin that you can bring into your garage or down into your basement in the winter months so that your kitchen scraps don't go down the disposal or to the landfill but go back and feed your garden. Again, remember there is no wrong way to compost, just compost. So there you have it. A little rotting plant material can go a long way towards making our garden and our earth healthier. Well, we're running a little short. What? Short on time, that is. Oh. We hope you've learned something about soil and how important it is we treat it with respect and not like dirt. All of our futures depend on having plenty of good, healthy soil under our feet to grow our food and other products that keep us healthy and happy. With more and more people living on the earth, our soil is wearing thin. Practicing conservation and good ideas like composting are things everyone can and should do to help preserve this most precious of natural resources. It's important, but not just for our own benefit. Truth is, we're only on this earth for a short time. And it's important that we leave something for those who will come after us, our children and their children. If we all do a little to help save our soils, Future generations will look back to our time and say, hey, those people were pretty smart. So now that you know the secrets in the soil, let's all use them to make the earth a greener and healthier place. Well, it's time for us to get grow, I mean, going. We'd like to thank all our guests who helped us learn about soil. And thank you for watching. Until next time, Bye bye. See ya.